This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and as always, there is a lot to cover today. The progress at Boca Chica continues with serial number eight going through some more testing prior to its 15 kilometer flight that we are thinking will be occurring in the upcoming week. Starlink's beta looks to have expanded to the public, so we'll talk about that along with SpaceX's incredible 100 flight milestone. We've got a new Crew-1 launch date set, which is exciting. Interesting news with confirmation that there are traces of water on sunlit areas of the moon. We'll dive into that, and yes, yet another beautiful flight by Rocket Lab launching Electron midweek. For many days the crane was holding up the nose as workers continued to weld the two pieces together, as well as connecting all of the pipes and electronics. Then at 5.30pm on Tuesday, the crane was detached from Starship serial number 8, leaving it standing free on its own. Beautiful sight there. The crane was then moved over to the orbital launch pad, and it's expected to be used to complete the launch mount. In last week's video we saw a new tent being built next to the orbital launch pad which now looks to be complete. Some portable buildings were then moved inside of the tent during the week, presumably office storage or break room space while there is so much building work going on at the launch site. Now, serial number 9 is still being worked on in the mid bay ahead of the attachment of the aero surfaces and the aft flaps that were just delivered to the site this week. SN9's forward flaps were also placed onto a truck to be moved around the facility. Starship serial number 11 is also coming along quickly with its common dome being sleeved just recently. Early in the week, a new nose cone was rolled out from one of the tents, and from now on we can presume that all new nose cones are in intended for flight, and thus this nose cone could be for serial number 9 or even serial number 10. Mary also spotted this 4 stack here with the label SN12 nose cone. This section will connect the nose cone to the actual tank section. Thanks to RGV aerial photography's photo here, we can see an abundance of parts that will likely make up Super Heavy serial number 1. It shouldn't be long now until we see that beast undergoing final stacking operations inside that high bay. On that note, the high bay itself looks to be almost complete, and on the inside we can see some sort of structure being built up from the floor. On closer inspection, it looks like scaffolding that is being built around one of those M stands. Those stands are the same ones that starships have been stacked on top of in the past. Could this scaffolding be for people to work around the super heavy thrust structure on the inside and the skirt on the outside? A lot of fine and detailed work will need to be done on that critical part of the vehicle. Now interestingly, these sections here were seen being moved to the launch pad and then were used to connect four roll lift vehicles together. Not 100% sure what this beast is going to be used for, but we are guessing that this could be a much larger platform that may be used to transport Starship SN8 back to the construction site after its hopefully successful flight. That's because it is much higher than the regular Starship prototypes we've seen so far. It's worth noting of course that these vehicles are actually called self-propelled modular transport transporters as people repeatedly insist on telling us here in the comments. Roll lift is the company brand name in this case, so we technically shouldn't call them roll lifts as a generic term, but you know, this kind of rolls off the tongue better than SPMT or self-propelled modular transporter. Now we've got some pretty interesting information from SpaceX's director Nick Cummings. Firstly, he showed a stunning aerial view of SN8 here during the Zoom call with Space Policy Online, but he also dropped some neat information too. He mentioned quickly that SN8 is of course on the pad getting ready to fly to 15 kilometers with three Raptor engines. SN9 and 10 are in production, and we now know that 50 Raptors have been constructed with the production rate expected to increase. He said that Starship's first orbital flight will be next year, and the first booster is in construction right now. All interesting updates there. Not a great deal has changed in the Starship components that we've been able to spot over the last week, but the latest updated parts for SN11 and SN12 seen in Brendan's diagram here have been updated in the diagram today, along with adding the Lunar Starship mock-up. Follow Brendan there, of course, on Twitter to see the latest changes as we spot them. Now, interestingly, last week SpaceX decided to swap one of SN8's three Raptor engines. Workers could be seen removing Raptor 
serial number 39 from Starship SN8. A second Raptor, SN36, was then delivered to the site on a transport truck, presumably from the McGregor testing facility. Now, once SN39 was removed, both it and SN36 were loaded onto a separate flatbed and were driven back to the production facility. It's kind of unknown as to why both were taken back, but in this picture here, we can see that there's a fair amount of plumbing missing from SN36 that is needed on SN39. Therefore, they might have just decided to swap those pipes at the build site rather than out in the open. Raptor SN36 was then installed in SN39's place around midnight on October 23rd. Regardless of why they swapped the Raptor, SpaceX did what they always do and reacted almost immediately, quickly replacing a Raptor engine to keep Starship serial number 8 on schedule for its 15km flight. This vessel is almost ready for the upcoming second static fire test, and this test will utilize a different process of feeding the three Raptors. For this static fire, the propellant will be drawn from the header tanks with the liquid oxygen header tank located in the tip of the nose cone and the liquid methane header tank integrated with the common dome. These header tanks, of course, hold the reserve fuel to be used just for the landing burn. All signs pointed to a second static fire test as early as Friday, October 30th, which was made official by a paper safety notice that SpaceX delivers to residents around 12 to 24 hours prior. Unfortunately, Elon Musk says that SpaceX ran into some challenges with the high winds, seemingly then cancelling that static fire attempt. Elon also mentioned that it's looking like Sunday for a static fire. There are two primary closure dates that are currently scheduled. These are 7pm to 1am on November 1st, and 9am to 11pm on November 2nd with backup dates on the 3rd and 4th also between 9am and 11pm. Now I just have to share this video here by Kimmy for those that haven't spotted it yet. Just check this out. Epilepsy warning here people. An incredible amount of detail and planning has gone into creating this. It's all a bit of fun, of course, mixing up the presentation style of the Cybertruck event, all mixed around this beautiful model of Starship there, taking the main focus of the video. This is Kimmy's Rave Cave, and I've just got to say, the lighting and camera work involved in this is just mesmerizing. I've watched it a bunch of times, and every viewing I see something I missed. Just icing on the cake here as well, with the Cybertruck rolling out and being presented with the Raptor engine. Serious talent there, Kimmy. If you're not following, head over to Twitter and change that, because who knows what's coming next. Also, a big thank you to you right there watching. All your support of the channel here is just awesome. Every like, comment, and subscription helps a huge amount. It even looks like I could hit a quarter of a million subscribers by January, and that is all because of you. Thank you very much. Of course, none of it is possible without Mary, aka Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight. Just check out that amazing sunrise shot taken here. We've also got those incredible perspectives from above, courtesy of RGV Aerial Photography. Just terrific shots here of Starship Serial Number 8 on the test stand. We also have the constant streaming there as well by Lab Padre, which is extremely useful for all of us watching so closely. These incredible sources are providing the world with this historic documentation, and we thank you not only now, but well into the future when people are learning of this pivotal point in our history where we left our home here on Earth for permanent settlement elsewhere. These records are incredibly important. Now, a quick update on the Crew-1 mission. It was announced during the week that NASA and SpaceX now are targeting Saturday, November 14th for the launch of the Crew mission. This will be the first crew rotation mission to the International Space Station as part of the commercial crew program. Of course, the mission had been scheduled earlier. However, there was some unexpected data popping up by SpaceX during a recent non-NASA launch that required a little more diagnostic work, which then pushed the launch back several weeks. On this Crew Dragon mission will be NASA astronauts Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and Michael Hopkins, and from JAXA, Soichi Noguchi. Now, the four will be up on the International Space Station for about six months before they return, so a much longer mission than Crew Dragon's Demo 2 that flew with Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. That mission lasted 62 days, so I can't wait for this much more extensive Crew 1 mission. It is going to be incredible. 
Now, launching from New Zealand this week, Rocket Lab's Electron mission, dubbed in Focus, carried Canon Electric's CE Sat 2B, which is a demonstration micro satellite. Along with that, it carried nine Super Dove Earth imaging satellites known as Flock 4E for rideshare customer Planet. Here we can see those Super Doves being integrated with the Maxwell dispensers and then being mounted to the kick stage. This launch itself, of course, proceeded beautifully. Yet another awesome liftoff and climb to orbit. Peter Beck announced the all satellites deployed confirmation, and there we go, another successful mission. Congratulations there to the team at Rocket Lab. Now this week, NASA announced some very interesting findings from its Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. For the first time ever, it has been confirmed that there are traces of water on sunlit areas of the Moon. That is exciting because it may be possible to source amounts needed for lunar bases and propellant plants in these areas. This isn't a new concept, of course. It's been believed for a long time that bases would initially be created near the poles, where the lunar surface had many craters and areas with very limited solar radiation. Although this may remain to be true, this news could mean that there are more possibilities for settlement locations on the lunar surface than we may have thought. As explained by Paul Hertz, now that we know that water is present within these areas, the previously believed understanding of the lunar surface has been challenged. Now this really is what we want to know more about. With resources such as water available, the opportunities for self-sustaining colonies becomes much more viable. If we can provide that life-sustaining water within future settlements at a variety of locations, locations on the Moon, and perhaps even export it to lunar gateways to supply other missions, that is an amazing thing. Taking it just a step further, perhaps we could produce liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen with electrolysis to use as propellant to launch smaller missions from the Moon. Now, as the research continues, we may find out a lot more about how this water is arriving at these locations. One theory is that some water may be being delivered by micrometeorites raining down on the surface. Fairly straightforward. Another more interesting theory is the possibility that solar wind delivers hydrogen to the lunar surface, which then causes a chemical reaction with minerals containing oxygen. All very interesting, and a link to that full article is in the description. Now, a big thank you to Vantage Films as well for creating these stunning visuals of a potential future moon colony. I just love it when we see such effort combining art and science together, all with that goal of inspiring all of us and making us dream of a better future. A future filled with amazing exploration of the moon and Mars, a future that I think we can all be proud of. Now, this particular video here was produced for the International Moon Base Alliance, which is an association built from incredible leading scientists and educators from space agencies and industries worldwide. Everything we are talking about starts right here. We can build moon-based prototypes and evolve those ideas before creating a real sustainable settlement on the moon. Very inspirational stuff. Now over to some Starlink news, SpaceX has officially begun rolling out the Starlink public beta across the United States and Canada. A Reddit user by the name of 4th Echelon 19 posted a screenshot of an email that he received from Starlink. This email was an invite to the first public Starlink beta named Better Than Nothing. Now some interesting information can be seen on this email. For this initial beta, estimated speeds range from 50 megabits per second to 150 megabits per second and a latency of 20 milliseconds to 40 milliseconds with the occasional service outages and connection interruptions. As far as anyone could see, there were no mentions of data caps either, so good news there. Now the price for this beta is $499 for the phased array antenna and the router, and then $99 per month for the subscription. Now although this startup price seems higher than many first expected, remember that this service is initially intended to provide access to areas that are not adequately covered and where access to the internet is poor or perhaps not even possible at all at this point. In line with this, SpaceX are providing free network access to families in a Texas school district as part of a trial. Now this will let SpaceX show the benefit of universal internet access providing equal education opportunities. So even though the target for Starlink is not to be competitive with areas well covered with fiber optic already, the speeds are already impressive. Keep in mind as well that currently the Starlink user terminal factory is in the very early stages of Starlink startup. They are mass producing a technology that has never been mass produced before in this way. We imagine that the cost required to access Starlink could drastically decrease as production ramps up. Now alongside the first beta invite emails from Starlink, the SpaceX division appears to have made both iOS and Android apps available on their respective app stores, so things are well underway. 
it's going to be real interesting hearing what people's experiences are with this system. For those reading the installation instructions, you will of course note that SpaceX's Starlink user terminals have been provided the nickname Dishy McFlatface, classic SpaceX there. If you happen to be tinkering around with your Starlink beta setup, let me know in the description. We would love to hear more about it. Speaking of Starlink, we just recently released a video rundown covering the past 12 months of Starlink launches, which you'll find at the end of the video if you missed it. But the most recent launch that deployed another 60 Starlink satellites into orbit was also a huge milestone for SpaceX, being its 100th successful flight. 100 flights since that first Falcon 1 successfully flew to orbit in 2008. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but first, our amazing sponsor, Brilliant. Running the channel here is extremely time consuming, and we we are super thrilled that Brilliant provides funding to help us improve and continue to create this content for you. This year, it has been instrumental to have such a core sponsor, and if you've been watching throughout that time frame, I'm sure that you can see the impact that this has made. Not only that, but it is terrific to work with a brand that develops such interesting math and science-based courses. They are all laid out just like a story and broken up into pieces so that you can work with each chunk at a time at a pace that suits you. I've more recently begun running over the the astronomy course with my eldest son, and even though some of it is a little advanced for him, I've had a lot of fun learning and then heading out with a telescope to check things out. By first gearing up with the basic tools to start understanding the universe, it makes the practical much more incredible. We live here in a universe with many billions of galaxies that each contain a cloud of hundreds of billions of stars. That is something that still blows my mind to this day. This stuff creates such interesting discussions that have then led us to other courses as well. If you're equally curious and you want to build up your knowledge and problem solving skills, then consider checking out Brilliant. By supporting them, you are supporting us here. So if you'd like to give it a try, head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link for that is in the description. So yes, let's take a look at the compilation put together by SpaceX. 100 flights since that first Falcon 1 successfully flew to orbit in 2008. SpaceX at that point, a company that no one had heard of, trying desperately to prove that they could get a rocket to orbit. Something that other companies like Blue Origin still have not yet achieved. Fast forward 12 years and SpaceX have landed boosters 63 times and also reflown 45 times. A great number of those, of course, in just the last few years. Now, I think it's worthwhile as well sharing this diagram being updated regularly by Space Nosy. This here gives us a terrific visual representation at a glance of all Falcon 9 Block 5 boosters, not just the current boosters in rotation, but also the boosters that are now out of service. Just take this booster B1046 as an example. This is the booster that was intentionally sacrificed mid-January in Crew Dragon's launch escape demonstration. That was its fourth flight, three of which landed on drone ships. It landed on Of Course I Still Love You Twice, and just read the instructions there in December 2018. We can also quickly tell from the days between launches indicator here how quickly the turnaround was between the flights. The green up arrow indicates a successful launch, green down arrows a successful landing. And if we see those arrows in red, well, I think that is probably obvious. The booster failed in some way. In this launch escape demonstration, the booster failed spectacularly on purpose, and that is indicated there with the red arrow. Of course, on the flip side there, we have all boosters still in service, and we see B1051, which just flew in yet another beautiful Starlink mission on October 18th. That sixth launch and landing there occurred only 72 days after the Starlink mission on August 7th. So yes, beautiful work there. I highly recommend following Space Nosy on Twitter there, shown on screen. Now, just quickly, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. There is no way that we could continue creating content at this frequency and length without you all. This support you all here provide allows us to increase the time that we can spend, and that is all thanks to the growing list of names that we can see right there. Thank you, each and every one of you. As the support here increases, that helps the entire team. So if you like what we're doing and would like to be a part of it, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server 
you can have earlier access to the videos, and you can also have your name appearing right there. Thank you very much for all of your support. Now, I know that everybody cannot donate in that way, but you here simply watching, liking, and commenting in these videos matters. Your subscriptions matter. And just as importantly, it is about sharing this excitement with your family and friends. You are amazing, and you're helping to drive this global passion to make all these dreams of colonizing other worlds a reality. A massive thank you as well to my Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for all of these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about Starship Serial Number 8. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.